in advance of the execution of the 2016 National Household Survey. Okay, so moving now to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada and their collection of data. Stateless is included as a citizenship category in the IRB basis of claim form. On the basis of claim form under the section, your citizenship, applicants are requested to list each country of which they are or have been a citizen and the status of their citizenship in the listed country or countries. The IRB's case management system allows for claimants' citizenship to be defined as stateless. The IRB receives and records country of persecution information for all claims, and since December 15, 2012, the IRB has been receiving and recording country of citizenship data. The IRB does recognize that the country of reference in respect of which the person is claiming protection may not be their country of citizenship. In support of their claim, claimants are asked to identify their country or countries of citizenship, as well as the country or countries where they are at risk of serious harm. Where the claimant does not have a nationality, authorities will assess the claim against the claimant's country of former habitual residence. With respect to testing for statelessness, or the absence of citizenship documents, presiding IRB Refugee Protection Division decision makers determine the steps that are taken in order to obtain the information required to assess the elements of the claim, including if the claimant has a nationality or is stateless. For example, the decision maker may request additional claimant-specific information, such as foreign status verifications or biometric information. As for reporting data, in their decisions, whether positive or negative, IRB decision makers regularly state the country of nationality of the claimant, or if the claimant is stateless, their country of former habitual residence. This data is collected in the IRB case management system and can be reported. However, the Refugee Protection Division does not report on the reason or reasons for which claims are accepted. The determining factors in each individual case are explained by the decision maker in their decision. As for our assessment, the IRB has implemented UNHCR recommendation number one and does collect and record information on individual stateless persons, country, or former habitual residents. And as I previously mentioned, the IRB has mechanisms in place for testing for stateless status that include foreign status verifications and biometric information. So moving now to recommendations. Uh, the IRB should implement reporting on whether statelessness was a factor in positive decisions. And two, if humanitarian and compassionate cases are not included in positive decisions, they should be included. So I will now hand things over to my colleague, Jocelyn Kay. Thank you. With respect to Citizenship and Immigration Canada, we found that from 2005 to 2014, there were 1,558 stateless persons who claimed refugee status in Canada. This relates to claimants only and does not confirm granted claim figures or denied claim figures. From 1981 to the third quarter of 2015, the total number of stateless persons granted permanent resident status in Canada is 316,739. This is very different from that 1690 figure of the stats count. This figure is not broken down into refugee, humanitarian, and compassionate grounds or whether permanent resident status was granted after the stateless persons had obtained a work or student visa. From 2010 to September 2015, the number of applications received from stateless persons for temporary residency is 11,808. For the same period, the number of visas, permits, and extensions issued for stateless temporary residents was 7,736. We assume here that the permits and visas 
are from within the period of 2010 to 2015. It is not clear, however, with respect to the extensions, whether this category applies to people who have secured their status prior to 2010 and have been granted an extension within that period of time. From 2010 to September of 2015, the number of applications received from stateless persons for permanent residency is 5,002. For the same period, the number of authorizations and visas issued for stateless permanent residents is 5,234. There is a discrepancy here because the authorizations and visas issued to stateless persons is larger than the applications received for that same period. The number of stateless persons who held work permits for humanitarian and compassionate purposes in 2014 to the third quarter of 2015 is 186. For the same period, the number of stateless international mobility program work permit holders is 46. For the same period, the number of stateless temporary foreign worker program work permit holders is 4. From 2001 to the third quarter of 2015, the number of stateless international students who receive study permits is 2,123. We also found that CIC reporting mechanisms do not capture the specific reasons for an approved humanitarian and compassionate application. There are no efforts underway to change current reporting mechanisms to include statelessness as a primary or significant ground for acceptance in humanitarian or compassionate applications, or to, or to include establishment in Canada or best interests of affected Canadian citizen children as grounds by which cases are assessed. From the data tables, from the CIC data tables, it is not evident that CIC reports data on stateless individuals granted permanent residency through private or government sponsorship. CIC reports that the total number of stateless persons granted permanent resident status in Canada since 81, again, is 316,739. But CIC does not identify how many of these stateless individuals have been granted citizenship since 1981. Data on stateless persons was not available by gender and age, the destination province or territory. We recommend to CIC that CIC implement reporting mechanisms that capture whether statelessness was a primary or significant ground for acceptance in agency humanitarian and compassionate applications. CIC should implement reporting mechanisms that capture whether establishment in Canada or best interests of affected Canadian citizen children are grounds by which cases are assessed in agency applications. CIC should report whether stateless individuals are granted permanent residency in Canada via agency, humanitarian and compassionate grounds, or private or government sponsorship. Fourthly, CIC should report the change in status of those stateless persons who acquire Canadian citizenship so as to accurately report the number of stateless persons currently in Canada. That's that 316,739 number. And fifthly, lastly, CIC should report the gender, age, and destination province or territory of stateless persons in Canada. With respect to Canada Border Services Agency, we found that CBSA reported 3,378 3,378 stateless people were inadmissible to Canada from the years 2003 to 2014. The majority of persons detained were detained at the U.S. border, numbering 1565, and inland, numbering 1499. The total number of days in detention that stateless persons spent from 2003 to 2014 is 42,916. The majority of those stateless persons detained from 2003 to 2014 were detained because of a removal order. And based on the total number of detainees and total number of de detention days, for this period, the average length of detention for a stateless individual is 81 days. Stateless persons were released from detention from 2003 to 2014 for a number of reasons, including released for removal, released on bond, released on conditions no bond, 
transferred to another facility and those released unconditionally. And the, the figures there are the numbers that CBSA provided with respect to each of those conditions. There have been 138 stateless individuals removed from Canada from 2003 to 2012 of deportation orders issued against stateless persons from 2003 to 2014, the following reasons were provided. Criminality lesser, criminality serious, human rights violations, misrepresentation, non-compliance, organized crime, and none. It is not clear what is meant by none here. However, it is clear, however, that serious criminality is the main reason stateless individuals are issued removal orders by CBSA, and again, those figures those numbers um, beside those classes are uh, from CBSA. Finally, CBSA does not record the citizenship and detention status of removed stateless persons in the countries to which they have been removed. Our preliminary numbers indicate that the top country to which male stateless persons in Canada are removed is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, and for females it is Tibet. Overall, it appears that the data collection practices of the CBSA are robust. CBSA has not, however, implemented UNHCR Recommendations 3 and 4, which refer to the collection of age and length of detention data, and country of former habitual residence, and legal status and country of destination, respectively. We recommend that CBSA implement those recommendations to collect and report data on detainee age and length of detention as well as collect and report data on the country of last permanent residence in addition to citizenship. Our final report will be made available in the coming weeks and can be accessed on our site. And that's our contact information if you have any questions. Thank you so much. that we stand between you and the reception, so uh, we're uh, um, very aware of that. Uh, I'd first want to uh, thank uh, Josh, Maria, Jocelyn, and Claire, and the team uh, really for inviting us. Um, we're a bit of an outlier here because uh, we do not work on uh, statelessness. However, um, I have started to work uh, on uh, uh, citizenship uh, in, I think, 2008 or 2009. Um, I uh, first did in 2014 uh, an IRPP study that is the Institute for Research and Public Policy on be how to become a citizen. So that was the, uh, I was interested in that because the uh, uh, government at the time made it increasingly harder to become a citizen. So that was not, uh, not to do with statuses per se. Uh, and I then also authored um, a report on, um, it's the Canadian um, the report on, on uh, citizenship uh, for Canada for the European Union project of citizenship in, um, uh, in 2015. And it's a website, I was unfortunately not as, as, as clever as so the rest of the gang uh, to put that up, but I really um, would like to point out you to the, um, the uh, UDO, that is EUDO uh, citizenship website, which is um, supported by the European Union. It's an entire uh, uh, website located at the um, University in, in, in Florence where you find uh, reports of, on citizenship and in part on statelessness. I must say that the research on citizenship is much better yet on, than on statelessness, uh, but it might be a good uh, resource. Uh, so, and in that report uh, that I did, I was also interested, obviously, in the 2008-2009, I say both dates, because in the um, uh, amendment to the Canadian citizenship on the first generation limitation, which uh, limits uh, the um, transmission of, of citizenship uh, to individuals that were born abroad and which is actually uh, creating a new class of uh, lost Canadians if you want. So I was then asked by, uh, or, uh, by the government of, of Canada or I'm part of the Kanishka project. Um, so that is uh, a question that was put to me and uh, some kind of uh, fellow re uh, researchers on uh, to ask to do how the research on how government uh, policies, namely immigration, citizenship, and uh, uh, anti-terrorism policies, would uh, if whether and how they would uh, contribute to the stigmatization of uh, minorities in Canada. 
um, and we were asked to uh, respond to this question by doing a media study. Uh, so the, it's a bit of a kind of a, a circle, as we will, I will, will explain. Uh, we picked the um, two bills, one, one bill, one law on uh, citizenship revocation as a case study, and that's what we're going to present here. Uh, and one of the questions that we were actually asking, how, do we, how are we to assess whether the government contributes to stigmatization by looking at the media? Uh, and you will see what we try to do is to look at, neither of us are trained in, in legal um, uh, studies, so what we not try to do is we leave it to the lawyers among you to look at the, the, bill, the law itself. However, what we did is we looked how the, it was debated in Parliament. It was perceived by the, by the print mass, uh, pr uh, press, by the media. And then uh, we also looked increasingly, and I picked this up from my students, how uh, it is debated, uh, the issue of citizenship revocation in online comments to media, because most of my students told me we don't read that hard stuff anymore. We go online, and then you have the comments uh, with every uh, you know media article. And I think so. That was a bit of an, an eye opener for me. What interested me, and I, I really think uh, what made the group uh, ask us to uh, participate here is also the the question of once exile and banishment become acceptable um, uh, solutions or option for punishment. What happens then? And although we will hear us not speaking lots about statelessness, I think the idea of you know whose citizenship can be revoked for what reason uh, is quite uh, scary to my uh, mind. I will hand over to Ivana, who has been um, a researcher, a PhD student, and has been working most of the uh, empirical work on this project. So she will um, present our findings. Thank you. So uh, in the past uh, four years, we have seen uh, two attempts to uh, use citizenship revocation as a means to uh, protect the uh, value of uh, Canadian citizenship to, quote, uh, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada. The first attempt was uh, a private member's bill, uh, Bill C-425 in 2012, uh, that proposed that uh, dual citizens uh, uh, lose their Canadian citizenship if they engage in an act of war against the Canadian forces. And uh, after a year after this bill died in uh, 2013, the same content in a slightly revised form was made law, so in 2014. And then since then, dual citizens who have engaged in uh, actions contrary to the national interests of uh, Canada, such as high treason, uh, terrorism, and espionage, can lose their Canadian citizenship. Uh, the measure came into effect uh, in June of last year, and uh, several uh, Muslim Canadians, uh, primarily those who were involved in the uh, Toronto 18 and the uh, Ottawa bomb plots, have since been targeted for uh, citizenship uh, uh, revocation by the Canadian government. So uh, the new government, uh, well, uh, the Liberals during the election campaign promised that they would uh, repeal uh, Law, uh, Bill uh, C-24, it's still uh, in effect uh, as of uh, now. Uh, so in this paper that is uh, still in, uh, in, in progress, we're still uh, working on it, so the, the, the numbers and the uh, findings will be uh, preliminary. We, like Alka mentioned, ask uh, who, who is, uh, who this, uh, uh, who citizenship revocation is about? Who is it targeting? Um, and who, who is interpreted as being the uh, a potential candidate for uh, citizenship revocation? And we're looking at we're looking at examples from the past and the present, um, and we attempt to, like uh, Elke mentioned, to answer these questions by looking at uh, four sets of texts. We're looking at the uh, uh, bills themselves. We're looking at the uh, uh, parliamentary debates and uh, uh, parliamentary uh, committee meetings. Uh, we're, we're looking at the mainstream press and we're looking at the uh, online comments um, posted to some of the news stories about citizenship revocation that is now available online. Uh, so, uh, in uh, framing this paper, uh, theoretically, we were drawing upon the uh, work of political so sociologist Christian Jokin, who argues that a citizenship is first and foremost the status of membership in a state which trumps all other dimensions, such as equal rights and identity, by providing elementary security and protection. 
She also argues in this uh, this article that uh, citizenship is becoming increasingly light. In other words, potentially meaningless. Uh, this is because citizenship, he argues, is becoming uh, increasingly uh, easy to get and connotes even uh, less in terms of rights uh, attached to it and is becoming a thinner in terms of the identities that states <coughs> seek to project on it. So applied to uh, the question of citizenship revocation, uh, the provision aims to lighten citizenship for some to grant uh, uh, security and protection for other citizens. And thin identities seem to be projected onto some dual citizens in order to make uh, uh, citi uh, citizenship thick and strong for the, for the rest. So we apply uh, Jopke's claim to the uh, discourses in question to ask exactly who are the uh, citizens uh, with thin identities that lighten the meaning of uh, Canadian citizenship. So, uh, okay, so this is, uh, uh, we, we, again, we're looking, we're looking at the uh, four sets of texts, um, uh, and uh, we use the combination of uh, um, qualitative and quantitative uh, methods to identify uh, who citizenship revocation is about. Uh, so we first uh, coded references to potential targets and we also used uh, word searches, uh, word counts and word frequency queries uh, just in case we missed something in the uh, process of coding. Uh, so we looked for references to individuals and groups, uh, their names, uh, their ethnic and religious uh, background, their second nationality if, if applicable, countries and regions they or their ancestors come from, um, events they are associated with, so potentially criminal uh, groups uh, they may be involved with. Uh, okay, so see, here are some of our uh, preliminary findings. Uh, first, we wanted to know which one of the uh, criminal activities, uh, so act of war, terrorism, espionage, high treason, was the mostly uh, frequently referenced one. And as uh, this table shows terrorism by far was the most frequently referred to criminal activity discussed in the uh, context of uh, citizenship revocation. And uh, what's interesting in the uh, online comments uh, is that treason was not too far behind uh, terrorism and we still have to uh, make sense of, uh, of, of this finding. Next. Uh, uh, we uh, looked at, uh, we divided our findings into references to individuals, events, criminal groups, and <coughs> ethnic or religious or national groups mentioned in the texts. And as we see here, uh, in both the uh, parliamentary debates and uh, newspaper articles, uh, those involved in past or present, mostly terrorism cases, but also other uh, criminal activities, were marked as potential targets of, of citizenship provocation. So this includes Canadians with dual citizenship that have been suspected, accused, convicted, or acquitted of mostly terrorism charges, either in Canada or abroad, and predominantly those of Muslim background. But for example, in the, uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, Omar Khadr was the individual that in the newspapers was uh, discussed most frequently as a candidate for citizenship provocation, and he was not mentioned at all in the parliamentary debates. Uh, it's possible that, it, that this is because parliamentary debates were more, more uh, general in tone. They, they made fewer uh, references to uh, individuals, uh, unlike the newspapers that uh, gave specific examples, such as uh, the Carter family and the case of Mohammed Fahmi. Uh, the online commentators uh, also referred most frequently to Omar Carter in, in discussing citizenship provocation, but interestingly, they are. Uh, here uh, mentioned other uh, in, uh, individuals and in mainly non-Muslims as well. These references were sporadic and small in number in comparison to primarily Omar Khadr, uh, but it, it was interesting nonetheless to uh, see references to Russell Williams and Robert Picton and uh, Vito Risotto and politicians as well. Um, so while uh, they were more creative and much more diverse in discussing who they feel could or should uh, be targeted for uh, uh, citizenship revocation. And here are some examples. Um, here, for example, in the uh, parliamentary debates, uh, uh, 
and we have uh, references to uh, to individuals in the background. Uh, now then we have uh, Kirk of the Russell Williams in the uh, newspapers. We have a comment that it's not it's not about Robert Picton or Paul Bernardo that it is about uh, uh, Omar Carter. Um, so in the, in the newspapers it was it was predominantly about uh, about Muslims. Then in the comments, um, here's an example of uh, some individuals that were mentioned in the comments, but also uh, Mr. Uh, Valkir, who was mentioned as, 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 as a, he has a dual uh, citizenship, so uh, if he were to become uh, prime, prime, prime minister and if he were to ruin the Canadian economy, that would constitute treason and that he would become a candidate for citizenship location. Uh, Stephen Harper as well. Okay, okay. So, uh, so then we looked at the uh, events um, that uh, uh, were discussed in this context and we can see here as well that uh, uh, it was mainly events that, that involved Muslims in the newspapers exclusively so, but in the uh, uh, debates and comments, uh, there were references to the uh, 1985 Air India bombing and the uh, 71 October crisis. So here are um, quickly just some um, examples. Uh, in Toronto 18, uh, the Bulgaria bombing, um, 1971 uh, October crisis. Um, okay, so uh, also here we have references to uh, uh, some, uh, some criminal groups. Um, so the, the newspapers, again, it's mostly uh, uh, criminal groups uh, that are associated with movements, whereas in the uh, uh, debates, and particularly in the uh, online comments, we have references to uh, mafia members, uh, to tail terrorists, and even uh, Christian terrorists, Scientologist terrorists, Jewish terrorists, so there's more of a variety of diversity in the online comments. Um, here's a few examples of here. Um, okay, so this is what's interesting. We have references to uh, the mafia. Uh, finally, so this is uh, this is what's interesting. These are uh, sort of hypothetical examples, so references to uh, um, ethnic and uh, religious and uh, national groups uh, in these three discourses. So we we, we, have, we see the question mark. These are the word counts. We haven't checked the context yet, so it's not. So we have 121 uh, mentioned of American Canadians. It doesn't mean that you know, they were mentioned this many times in the context of. As, as potential targets of citizenship revocation, we can say that uh, in the newspapers, uh, it was predominantly um, uh, uh, Muslim Canadians that were given as seemingly innocuous examples of groups that would be targeted. For example, in, in the debates, for example, uh, we have an, uh, uh, an example of somebody from Italy or somebody from Morocco coming to Canada who has Canadian citizenship and Jews as a terrorist group. Um, okay, two minutes. Okay. We mm -hmm. okay, okay. We have the environmentalists as well. <laughs> okay. So uh Greenpeace, uh, let me just okay. So um, our main uh, conclusion is that even though we have uh, we ha have this uh, this uh, uh, diversity uh, in the uh, uh, online comments, in particular, some in the debates as well, not so much in the uh, newspapers. That is, that the, the uh, question of citizenship uh, location is uh, about Muslims. Uh, Muslim Canadians are uh, interpreted as being the uh, potential recipients, and not just uh, uh, those who were uh, involved in uh, terrorism cases. It sort of sort of spills out, out through. Um, uh, these in examples of uh, you know, in seemingly again innocuous examples of you know, groups that you know, could be affected by it, or for example, newspapers interviewing members uh, uh, of uh, 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 Muslim ethnic groups 
uh, asking them questions on what do you think, what do you think about citizenship revocation, why not ask somebody else, why ask, why ask these, uh, these, these, these two members. Uh, so uh, this, is, um, this is our main finding. Maybe we have a few more, but... I would just to add my two cents to it, because I mean, Ivana has to be a good PhD student, uh, and I have the liberty of kind of going...